Good morning, all. I'm going to call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum, but before we get started, I just wanted to tell you the process we're going to go through for the next week. Um, our uh, we're going to have an omnibus bill, uh, and so all the bills that we will be talking about will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The omnibus bill will be voted on. We will have it ne up next Tuesday, uh, and we will get it out next Tuesday night. We have uh, room reserved for night if folks would like to spend the evening with me. I'm glad to have folks spend the evening with me. Uh, I hope to have the bill posted on Friday uh, to give folks ample uh, room for uh, amendments or ample time for amendments. We're going to have some bills on uh, Thursday. I am not sure we will be in possession of all the bills, uh, but we will have uh, informational hearings on Thursday if we're not in possession because some of them will be uh, done Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, any questions, members, about the procedure? No questions? Yes, Representative McNamara. Madam Chair, does that include House File 84? Will that be laid over for possible inclusion? The yes. last bill? Thank yes. you. It, it's the bills today and uh, the bills that we have on Thursday. Yes. All right, with that, uh, we are going to, Representative Hansen isn't here. He had some, uh, he's here. He's oh, he's, he, well, he's not down here yet. So we're going to start with Representative Falk, House File 1976. Representative Falk. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we have a DE1 amendment before us, and Ms. Taylor actually has a small technical change to incorporate into that. So I would like her to report a technical change. We can incorporate that into the DE1 and then adopt the DE1 amendment. Okay. First, uh, we need to, for you to move House File uh, 1976. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move House File 1976 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. All right, and we have an amendment uh, in in your packet, members. Uh, uh, and uh, council, and the amendment would be to the DE one amendment that's in your packet. If you go to line two point one three, after prairies, insert and other native species. We do have a 24-hour rule, uh, but if there aren't any objections, I'm inclined to waive the rule um, because this bill is going to be laid over for possible inclusion and there will be ample time uh, for amendments later. <laughs> I don't see any objections. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment to the amendment say aye. 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 Uh, all the, uh, the amendments to the amendment passes all uh, is adopted. All those in favor of the adopting the amendment say aye. 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 Any objection? The amendment has been adopted. Representative Falk. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. House File 1976 is um, the establishment of a terrestrial invasive, uh, in, or I guess we deem it the Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center at the University of Minnesota. And the purpose of this is to hopefully have a, a more proactive approach in dealing with some of the threats that face our state's prairies, forests, wetlands, and agricultural resources. And I know what often has become the issue is that we see a threat facing the state and we have to kind of scramble to go in and get together a response to it. And oftentimes we're having to go in and do a lot of work very quickly, whereas if we can go and have the people and the infrastructure in place to go and make that task more proactive, I think we'll be better equipped to deal with some of these threats that face our state's significant resources. 
the um, the center, as it, I'll just refer to it, it would be a collaboration between the College of Food and Agricultural Natural Resources Science in coordination with the College of Biological Sciences. And we're trying to bring together folks with different experiences across the following departments are listed in the bill, but I'll just go through them. Entomology, plant pathology, forest resources, horticultural science, fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology, agronomy and plant genetics, plant biology, and ecology, evolution, and behavior. And in addition, across those different departments, we'd also like to fully utilize the resources we have around the state, including the Cloquet Forestry Center, North Central Research and Out Outreach Center, Northwest Research and Out Outreach Center, Southern Research and Outreach Center, Southwest Research and Outreach Center, West Central Research and Outreach Center, Rosemont Research and Outreach Center, and the Horticultural Research Center, and the Sand Plain Research Center. And so we really want to bring together a broad group of people from across the state to go and best develop methods and practices to go and control both invasive species and kind of what I deem to be agricultural weeds. Um, in addition to focusing on that aspect, we want to make sure we also focus on pests and pathogens and the threat that they also pose to our state's um, resources. One of the tasks the center will be designated to uh, create is a prioritized list of uh, pest and plant species that threaten our state's prairies, forests, wetlands, and agricultural resources. And that will help us to go and better determine which things need immediate attention and perhaps immediate, immediate funding um, as projects are moving through processes like the LCCMR request. Um, after creating that prioritized list, the center will also be focused on research on the species on the prioritized list, developing new control methods including biocontrols, and uh, looking at integrated pest management tools, uh, focusing on prevention, and then looking at the consequences that some of those management techniques may have on our native prairies, pollinators, water resources, and other native species. And lastly, we want this center to report back to us by the 15th of January to, uh, um, to help us formulate the response that, and the decisions that we have to make in the legislative process as to best deal with these threats. Uh, with me I have Dr. Brian Burr. I believe um, you're serving as interim dean and uh, for the College of Agricultural Food, or I'll let you, in <laughs> I'll get the acronym wrong, but I'll, I'll give it over, turn it over to him. Dr. Burr, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Representative Falk, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me today, and thank you for introducing this bill related to um, terrestrial invasive species. Um, I brought with me Professor William Hutchison, who's seated behind me. He's the head of entomology. Um, I bring a, I'm an economist. I bring a science expert with me whenever I have the opportunity um, to talk about. He works in the area of insect invasive species. And what I thought I would do is just give a brief overview of how the University of Minnesota would approach this, starting with what the impacts of invasives are. There's some slides up here that I consider the rogues gallery of, of uh, invasives in Minnesota and how broadly they impact us. Um, overall, economically, the impacts of invasive species across the U.S. looking at published research is about $134 billion across the country. In Minnesota, we estimate there's about $3 billion, and that's probably light um, given that it cuts across not only, you know, private sector economic impacts, but a lot of public sector impacts and ecosystem services, water clarity, water use issues. Um, it affects plant life. It affects forestry. Very cross-cutting issues related to, to, um, to invasive species. And that's one of the aspects that I think CFANS, which is the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, um, uh, helps bring to this. We have a broad, diverse faculty and engagement to do that. Um, many of these species, as you look at them, affect not only uh, rural habitat, whether it's forestry, wetlands, uh, farming. Um, it also affects our urban landscape when you think of emerald ash borers, for example, that impact the canopy in, in urban areas. So very broad um, and diverse effects. As also you see the slide, you'll see uh, which affects how we approach this, that some of these are pathogens, microbial infections, whether it's viral or uh, bacterial. Um, infections like oak wilk, for example, <laughs> includes insects, which brings together entomology. It includes weeds, um, where we get into agronomy, plant sciences, and, and so on. Um, we envision putting the center together really with the principle that Representative Falk talked about of identifying a, a net impact of, of uh, invasives. 
Um, as you can tell from these slides, there's many, many different types of species requiring many different mechanisms of control or identification and management. And so we'd start off with is trying to get at, you know, what is our potential to have the most impact on these, uh, whether that's through control or prevention. Um, you know, where is it economically that they have the most impact? Um, and start to, to um, be able to identify which of these do we address first to be able to effectively use those resources and move them forward. Um, we'd also be, of course, looking at there is a designated list of invasive species that's been identified um, through the, the DNR and, and Minnesota Department of Agriculture. We'd be using that as a potential list to look at where should we uh, invest and make, it, make efforts in, in, in addressing these species. We would, we would approach this not only from a control perspective, but one of the aspects is before things move into the state, um, are there ways to prevent their, their introduction to start with? Um, along with early detection, if they do arrive, to be able to intervene when the, the scope is not that large, where you can have more localized, more effective interactions. And then, of course, looking at those uh, endemic issues that we have um, that are widely dispersed in the state and trying to, you know, hopefully eliminate or eradicate, but of course also perhaps trying to control and localize those impacts, they don't spread as rapidly. So a multi-pronged approach, um, dependent upon what the species is, what we think the impact is, we can have. Um, we'd certainly be looking at, at, at biocontrol methods, uh, an, an important way of looking at this, integrated pest management, and other technologies that might come into play. So very broadly looking at methods we might get at controlling invasive species. We're certainly aware, if, if you watch the, the bee colony collapse issues that are emerging across the country, we're aware of non-target effects of various control mechanisms. So we'd be looking at ways we control these that we'd like to you know, minimize the impacts on other native species, whether it's plants, whether it's insects, or whatever those other natives might be. So really looking carefully at, at how do we control those non-target impacts. And of course, um, as CFANS often does, we have already have strong relationships with Minnesota Department of Ag, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and looking at building across state agencies and other, other organizations that are also working to, to affect the um, invasive species. One of the things that's not in the bill that we would likely look towards, Minnesota does have an extension service, and one of the aspects we see of invasives is often you know, citizens' activities in both identifying where they are. It's oftentimes somebody out in the field um, that finds a species and reports that in. So if you look at DNR's websites or Department of Ag's websites, they have reporting services. And then oftentimes it's citizens also acting in control and, and, and elimination. So that is something that we have the capacity to do that's certainly not part of the bill. We would be looking at bringing that to bear as well on some of these issues. Um, I, I, I alluded to several times our capacity and Representative Falk read through the list of programs. And one of the really interesting things for, for CFANS is we do have existing researchers in entomology, plant pathology, forest resources, horticulture, applied economics, fisheries, wildlife, <coughs> agronomy, and bioengineering that are engaging in these, some of these activities already. Um, what, this, what this bill really does for us is looking at bringing a more concerted um, coordinated effort across those where we look at, for example, bioengineering is looking at early detection, monitoring techniques to see where invasive species are, you know, tying that into with, for example, entomology and looking at the spotted wing drosophila. Um, one of those things that if you're thinking of invasives is not a particularly appetizing version of invasives. Um, it comes into soft skin fruits, black or blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, the grape industry, um, the larvae hatch in those, in those um, and so the tests that um, Dr. Hutchinson talks about is uh, putting the berries on your shelf for a day, and if you have maggots on your on your your countertop, there are spotted Drosophila larvae there. So some of these things and crossing then, how do we identify where those are spreading to? Um, might rely on some of the monitoring techniques from from bioengineering, for example. So being able to address those in a concerted way is really a highlight of this. Uh, oftentimes, our faculty are working on them, but they're fairly targeted, uh, specific um, projects. Um, this would help to tie those together. Um, finally, just to talk a little bit about the research outreach centers, uh, as you look at these species, you find they, they affect many different habitats from agricultural zones in the southern part of Minnesota to forestry in the northern part of Minnesota, um, to wetlands, to prairies. Um, and so one of the things our research outreach centers provide us is they're, they are, we are present across the state in those. We have researchers on hand there, Grand Rapids, Cloquet Center is already looking at um, you know, forest impacts of emerald ash borer and other issues. Uh, Grand Rapids is looking at, the, at some of the fruit um, production impacts of these. So we're able to draw across these diverse landscapes to address more broadly those impacts. Within the university, just from the standpoint of structuring this into the university, we would look at this as being a, a college-wide and, and 
across college with, with uh, college of biological sciences program to draw across these disciplines. In many cases, like aquatic invasive species, fairly focused on wildlife conservation biology. Um, in this case, because we draw across these di disciplines, we would have it as a, a college level center. And the idea of that is to be able to um, engage more broadly across disciplines um, where there are implications for how we control or, or address some of the invasive species issues. Uh, we would view there as being a faculty research leader on this to coordinate activities. That would be someone who could overarch across these. Um, and they would report ideally directly to the, the dean of the college so that we could coordinate efforts and be more effective in scaling those up. Because we have quite a few of the faculty resources there that are occurring already, we would really like to focus on graduate research assistants and postdocs, which builds into workforce development around these issues. That as we visit, in fact, I visit with Commissioner Landwehr with DNR, um, we talk frequently about um, you know, workforce development in these areas that we simply don't have the students coming out or enough students coming out to address the diversity of issues out there. And in bringing grad students into these research projects helps, helps move us into building that capacity to address these more broadly across agencies and so on as they're trained in these areas. Um, so with that, um, I'll just reiterate that the college is, is very supportive of this. We believe we have the capacity to do the research. We have faculty. I've met with, with department heads across each of these departments and meetings. We've discussed our abilities to address these. They're excited about the prospects of working on these important issues. They're working on them already. Um, so we have, and we have grad student support. The ROCs are supportive of the proposals. Um, and we're collaborating already with several NGOs, uh, state departments, and certainly LCCMR on these proposals. And thank the, um, the House of Representatives for bringing this bill forward and appreciate that support. So thank you. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to, to address those. Questions, members? I, I think we have some folks in the audience who would like to testify too, but questions for members before that? Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Representative Falk, thank you for uh, bringing this bill forward. I know we spoke out in the parking ramp, and, and uh, we had some individuals that uh, had, had some concerns uh, initially that it was uh, too restrictive. And with uh, the DE amendment, I think it addresses those concerns. So I thank you for that as well. And and uh, to uh, Dean Boer, if uh, President Kaler's watching, hopefully it won't be interim dean. Um, if he's, uh, I know this is televised. I would uh, just like to go on record that uh, you have my support, uh, and I think that you know many people support to be uh, named dean. Um, we're talking about uh, uh, invasive species. Could you comment a little bit about the university and what we're doing on emerging diseases? Uh, any research around that, or what research is taking place on emerging diseases? Okay. Um, thank you, Rep uh, Madam Chair, Representative Hamilton. Um, thanks for your question. Thank you for your support. I appreciate that as well. Um, then you're talking about emerging diseases, uh, animal diseases, plant diseases, and so on. Um, yes, and Madam Chair, and just to clarify, and because uh, I agree um, with Representative Falk, we need to do this. And and uh, I asked a question to uh, an individual who was in agriculture who's passed away. Um, I said, "What's the biggest threat to agriculture?" And uh, you know, it wasn't price, it wasn't markets. He said, "Emerging diseases." Right. And so I know we need to continue investing in research. And this bill that uh, Representative Falk is bringing forward. Uh, uh, we'll do that on the uh, invasive species. I just want to know, are we doing enough for, to address emerging diseases with the university, or do we need to do something additional with that as well? Yeah. Madam Chair, Representative Hamilton. Um, yes, we are, and we're doing quite a broad array of that, both in animals and plants. So with invasive species, starting with plants, uh, for example, we have biosecure level two and biosecure level three uh, laboratories at the University of Minnesota that can also address actually insects and other pathogens that allow us to identify and overwinter pathogens that often aren't active. So we have a unique comparative advantage at the University of Minnesota in dealing with, for example, plant disease. And that includes you know, soybean rust, we're looking at UG99 fungal infections in, in cropping systems and so on. And then the veterinary lab, of course, the University of Minnesota's veterinary diagnostic lab. And so recently, and as I look at my background is often working with animals as well as plants, um, as we look in the state of Minnesota now and across the country, PDV is a, is a disease that occurs in swine. And this, the veterinary lab here at the University of Minnesota has been very active in doing research on PDV. And I think this also raises the point that as we look at the emergence of you know, changes in, in climate patterns in the U.S., whether it's variability and so on, what we're starting to see is emergent diseases, as you, as you suggested, Representative Hamilton, coming in in both animals as well as plants, um, the disease we might not have had. And soybean rust is one of those that coming up on wind currents from thunderstorms um, and with more humid, uh, more intense rainfalls presents a pattern where that becomes more emergent. 
and we're seeing that with other diseases of forests and so on too. The boreal forests in northern Minnesota are impacted by pathogens that we wouldn't have seen maybe 20, 30 years ago. And so we're going to see more and more of these emergent, particularly pathogens, some of the, you know, we have emerald ash borer, some of the insects that wouldn't necessarily survive in this zone uh, without some changes in, in whether it's variability or weather patterns. And so what we expect to see is more and more emergent of things that wouldn't necessarily have been in Minnesota. We were naturally protected. Um, Dr. Hutchinson, for example, has talked about the overwintering capabilities of things like emerald ash borer. This deep winter has an impact on what affects us. So we see this as not only being affecting those that are here, but we need to be more vigilant because we're going to see increases in those emerge, I think, as we go through time and to be able to address those. And I think we're well positioned across both animals and plants. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome to committee uh, interim, Dean Burr. Glad to see you here this morning. Um, my first question has to do with the uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Center we've already set up. Uh, I noticed there, we have pictures of some aquatic plants uh, in your presentation. How do you see the two uh, centers, if this uh, goes into law, how do you see the two centers interacting? Okay. Madam Chair, Representative Torfson, um, thank you for that question too. We do see this as a broader strategy within the college now emerging. Um, eventually as we move, AIS right now, Aquatic Invasive Species, is a standalone center. It's primarily managed out of the Fisheries Wildlife Conservation Biology Department. Um, and it is focused specifically on aquatic invasives, so Asian, Asian carp, European carp, uh, zebra mussels, and so on. Um, that, what we would see happening with this one coming in is to create a more integrated uh, invasive species. So, for example, with the carp, they affect both the, the plant life as well as the plankton. Zebra mussels are affecting native mussels. Um, so we do cross in some ways with aquatic plants, and here we have common reed as something that's an issue uh, in, in our wetlands and, and water systems. So what we would see this emerging to as a, as a cross collegiate, and including CBS, for example, working on bow remediation and some of the containment issues with microbials. To, to turn those into an aquatic invasives, perhaps institute, but a more, a more high level version um, within the college as that moves along. So we see it as compatible with that and helping to bring some of the, the support infrastructure to that as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now, much of the uh, thing, many of the things you've outlined in your report are, are activities that are already going on at the university. Um, how do you see this legislation changing, will it change the focus of your work or just add a new perspective, new perspective or better coordination? Because uh, you, do, you do much of this work already. Right. Madam Chair, Representative Torkelson, um, yes, we do do some of that work. And as I visit about a little bit, oftentimes those are specific research projects. For example, an RFP comes out to address spotted wing drosophila. And so that would go, for example, to the Department of Entomology. They would work specifically on that issue. Um, at the same time, you know, that might, if, as they're working with other researchers, it might lead to a cooperative project with bio-based product engineering. Um, there could be elements of biocontrol that go over into microbial sciences trying to find ways to control that, but it's not necessarily a part of that proposal. So first we'd be always looking towards, as part of this, this underlying, how do we do this net impact, is trying to coordinate across those to say, where are those pieces where we have the most ability to address those two or three issues, to control, identify, and address the issue. And so it would bring that coordination that oftentimes, you know, as we, we get individual projects, um, they don't coordinate as well. And then the hope would be, um, you know, in building, particularly with grad students, um, we're building some of the capacity to be able to do these things as well. And the third piece is um, working across state agencies. Um, we've had a strong relationship working with them, and this helps us to bring some capacity um, to engage them as well. So I think there are many dimensions to how this helps to, to coordinate those activities and expand them and be more effective. <laughs> Thank you. Just one more question, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, I, I congratulate uh, Representative Falk for bringing agriculture into this mix. I think that's a good idea. Uh, but uh, Interim Dean Burr, do you see any potential for conflict down the road uh, between, let's say, the commercial side of this and the native side of this? Um, Madam Chair, Representative Torkelson, um, I hadn't thought about that much. Um, if there are commercial, you know, I could see an element where with, um, you know, you know, methods of control, for example, and chemical sides, whether it's resistance issues and so on, there being possibilities. 
but ultimately in, in invasive species side of this, most of this are, if you're looking at agriculture, of course the weeds, the pest, pests of livestock and so on are elements that have economic impacts across that board. Um, as we look at this, we're looking at, of course, as how do we create the science that addresses the issues that are here. So that was, Madam Chair, would it be okay if uh, Professor Hutchinson? Absolutely. Thank you. Please put your name in for the record and yes. welcome. Uh, uh, my name is Bill Hutchison, Professor of Entomology and Department Head uh, in CFANS for Entomology and appreciate the opportunity to uh, assist Brian uh, Burr here today as well. Uh, just, just quickly, uh, I think there are many areas with our invasives that there's actually a lot of crossover bet between the natural systems that we work with and agriculture. And so uh, buckthorn, uh, which is recently shown here, common buckthorn, uh, just continues to be probably one of the poster childs for the worst case invasive that we can think about if you've got any of this in, in your own yards. It's very difficult to deal with. One of the interesting things with spotted wing drosophila is just one example, uh, is that we have some preliminary data uh, to show that the uh, females can also oviposit in uh, some of the buckthorn berries and thus there's a possibility of either overwintering in the berries being further dispersed by the uh, berries as they fall, etc. So uh, that's an example where you know these insects don't necessarily see the boundaries that we often look at, uh, where they they can uh, use these natural systems as reservoirs, in essence, or alternate hosts as reservoirs to then, in the spring and during the growing season, uh, further infect. Uh, some of our agricultural crops. So from our perspective, I think for many of these pests and or pathogens, we can see a crossover uh, and, and really not, you know, that, that, just, that just adds to the fact that we need to study both systems in concert as part of these interdisciplinary efforts. So if that helps. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know I said it was my last question, but we have a new testifier, so. Pardon? <laughs> we have a new testifier, so <laughs> uh, I guess I'm more interested. Uh, uh, Representative Torkelson, we have reserved this room for this evening, too. And if we do not finish these three bills this morning, we will do them this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know how much I like spending time with you. So. I know. <laughs> so I just wanted to remind you that you had the opportunity. Um, I guess I'm curious a little bit about uh, control methods that we might use for these invasive pests and how they might affect uh, the commercial side of things differently than they might affect the natural side of things and how there might be conflicts there and how would this college or research center deal with priorities? Uh, right, great question. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the term proactive was used earlier in introducing this bill and I think that's really the key as part of the risk assessment. Uh, you really have to go with the opportunities for uh, biological control for certain pests where we have those and sometimes in the commercial ag settings with spotted wing drosophila, for example. One of the worst case invasives that, that I've dealt with in my career uh, and we had, so when, when that hit in August of 2012, uh, we had growers that were just moving into the peak raspberry uh, harvest season. Uh, we didn't have time. It hit so fast and so drastically throughout the state. It was not a slow moving uh, insect pest. Uh, it's so quickly that we had to quickly develop uh, control guidelines which required the use of traditional insecticides. We do have some organic certified insecticides. Uh, but this is just a, probably a worst case example where we, when we don't have the funding up front to really develop a true proactive risk assessment, communicate to the stakeholders, in this case the growers, uh, organic and conventional growers, uh, to an audience that uh, for 30 years has really not had to use insecticides that much. It was a huge culture shift. It was a huge uh, educational challenge. Uh, and, and so in settings like that where you're dealing with uh, high cash crops, high value crops, um, and they're looking, and growers were literally going out of business 
uh, by mid-September or just discontinuing their pick your own op operations for that fall. Um, you know, that's a situation where we have to act quickly. We have to look at what uh, has worked in other states, Michigan State, North Carolina in this case. We had very little data to go on. So in those commercial ag settings, uh, we don't always have the luxury of a four to five year biological control project. That, that in essence for agriculture is still our long term goal. Uh, great way to go. It's worked great for alfalfa weevil and alfalfa uh, 20 years ago. Uh, that is still an effective program in most areas of the state. So it's the, definitely the long way, long, best long term way to go in terms of hmm? reducing oh. pesticide loads in the environment, reducing costs to the growers, and long term control. But it depends on the past. It's sort of a case by case basis, uh, if that helps. Thank you. I don't see any other questions right now, so I would. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Madam Chair. I did as long as Dr. Hutchinson's there. Dr. Hutchinson, I'm curious. Um, on the second page of the handout we were given, uh, the earthworm is on there, but Norway maple is on there. I'm curious, um, I'm not sure who picked that species to be on that slide. I'm just curious if you could expand that, or maybe you're not, is, is it your handout, Dr. Hutchinson? That I uh, did not have a lot of personal input on the handout uh, from Brian Burr's office, but uh, the earthworm, in briefly, all I can really refer to or uh, address is the earthworm question is just being very disruptive. No, I'm okay with the earthworm. Forest floor ecology, but the, you mentioned the Norway maple. Yeah, I'm just surprised. Uh, we've got a lot of species that are much more invasive than Norway maple. I'm surprised to see that species on this. Right. And, and that the is emphasis out, there. You know, uh, great question. That's outside my area of expertise. Okay. So Thank you, Madam Chair. I just would like if the university could get back to the chair on the selection of that species. Um, I'm surprised at that. Well, Brian might be able to. Madam Chair, Representative, I believe that's on, so it is listed as one of the invasive species in Minnesota. And the reason for it is oftentimes you have plants that are brought into the state, treat woody plants, so this is kind of a horticultural piece. Um, woody plant, it was meant to be representative of woody plants coming in that aren't native to the state that can crowd out native species of plants. Um, and so for the horticulture industry, the question is often, it raises the question of human intermediation, the role that we have and as we move plants and, and also species into the state. Um, it wasn't meant to identify any particular particular plant or any particular species. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could just expand, uh, there's a number of species that would have been better suited to be in this picture than Norway maple. Norway maple and its cultivars play an important role in our urban forestry. Um, that specifically is on this slide, and I'm thinking I can think of a number of tree species that would be better to be there. Um, and I'm not aware of that being on the invasive species list in itself. It, I mean, Amber Maple would have been a lot better to be there, and they're both still planted today uh, in this state uh, than this one. I can just think of many more better than this one. I'm surprised at selection. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I had a question for the the, the other doctor, if uh, we could play musical chairs again and ask him a question. A lot of talk in this committee uh, during the session about pollinators and uh, the effects of uh, spraying insecticides and such. And one of the things we talked about uh, was, was uh, spraying soybeans for aphids, for example. We'd just like to ask if the university is doing any research on coming up with a biological control through the seed or whatever else to uh, hopefully that we could get away from spraying uh, soybeans for aphids that would help our pollinators as well. Okay, thank you for the question, Madam Chair and, and committee member. <laughs> Yes, the, so we've been dealing with the soybean aphid uh, since about 2000 when we first discovered it uh, in Minnesota. And uh, that's an example of a, a relatively slow moving uh, invasive uh, that took three years plus or minus to make it across the state. And so most of the insecticide load in soybean still is directed at that pest. I should say we also have brown marmorated stink bug in the state, another invasive that's on its way. And it is here, I should say, but it's just now building up to larger numbers. Um, 
So that said, uh, that is a key part of our educational extension outreach effort with growers is to continue to emphasize only spray as needed based on an economic threshold uh, value of approximately 250 aphids per plant that was developed in our department and with other states participating. Uh, that said, just using that guideline, uh, that decision point alone can have a, you know, greatly reduce insecticide use. So, or risk averse growers might want to spray three to four times an extreme year in Minnesota for this one pest. Many years, many fields, only one spray is really needed if you follow that guideline. So, uh, or if growers follow those guidelines, uh, we work with crop consultants as well who often manage 10,000 acres each and many growers. So uh, that said, uh, also the time of day. So let's just say, yes, we do need to spray. So time of day plays a huge role. If you can spray later in the evening after honeybees or other bees are, are not foraging, uh, that's another way to protect bees. What we really need more data on on that topic is what uh, exactly is the both uh, native bumblebee and honeybee foraging behavior in a crop like soybean. Soybean flowers are not the most attractive flowers, at least a honeybee. Uh, and uh, Iowa State, there's some data now coming out of Iowa. We, more, we need more data like this from Minnesota. Uh, but basically the preliminary data out of Iowa is that by far the dominant bee species in soybean uh, are all the native bumblebees. Many, uh, uh, many species of uh, either ground nesting uh, bumblebees or others, such that honeybee is probably less than 1% of the total bee diversity that's in that crop. And the same goes for corn, uh, just a side note. So, uh, you know, part of that is a huge risk assessment on, uh, in terms of neonic uh, seed treatment exposure to bees through the flowers, uh, systemically through the plant uh, that might accrue and uh, accumulate in the nectar of those flowers. Part of it is the direct, probably the biggest risk in soybean right now would be the direct foliar applications uh, for soybean aphid or some of the other pests. So that's what we are focusing on. Bob Cook is our soybean entomologist who's uh, leading that effort uh, as well. So I hope that answers your question. That is uh, one of the issues we have been talking about and uh, obviously native bumblebees are in great decline too. Mm -hmm. So as right. uh, has been part of our conversation here. Uh, Representative Keel, did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, Dr. Zometa has, uh, would like to testify. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Dave Zometa. I serve as Executive Director of the Minnesota Forest Resources Council. Council is created by the Sustainable Forest Resources Act of 1995. Council includes 17 diverse interests, 16 appointed by the Governor, one by the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Core mission of the Council is to advise the Governor and Legislature as well as public agencies on sustainable forest policies and practices. Forest Resources Council has had a long-standing interest in the issue of terrestrial invasive species. The 2007 legislature directed the council to create a forest protection plan task force. It was charged with developing a plan to prepare the state for early detection of an appropriate response to invasive forest pests and public education about invasive pests that threaten our forests across the state. Two key findings from that task force's 2008 report to the legislature included, number one, because of global trade and increased travel, new pests threaten the health and survival of many tree and other forest species in rural, suburban, and urban areas across Minnesota. Second, failure to detect and eradicate invasive forest pests costs hundreds of millions of dollars of the three-plus billion dollar impacts that Dr. Burr estimated across all types of land in Minnesota in his, in his written uh, remarks that he handed out to you in your packets. These, these impacts cause serious harm to Minnesota's environment and economy, including 
the six to seven billion dollar forest products economy, the nine billion dollar tourism economy, and the, and the even larger agricultural economy. Since 2012, the impact of terrestrial invasive species on forest health has been one of my council's top forest policy issues. Council's been working with the University of Minnesota, the DNR, the De Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and relevant federal agencies to heighten awareness and understanding of economic and ecological impacts of these species. My council supports the proposed center for the following four reasons. One, the center would serve as a lead role would serve a lead role in terrestrial invasive species research and education across not only forest lands, but across farmlands, wetlands, and prairies. Forests are interspersed with these other types of land across the state. This center could play a critical integrative role that no single institution is filling today to the detriment of both our economy and our environment. CFANS and the proposed center are unique, would be uniquely suited to fill this integrative role. Second, the proposed Terrestrial Plants and Pest Research Center would be a major step toward improving our collective understanding of which terrestrial invasive species in Minnesota are the most important to control and what the most effective control strategies may be. S some species are not amenable to control and we can spend a lot of money and waste a lot of money trying to control them when we, when we, it's not going to work. Other species we may not be spending enough money on and this across sectors, this would be a, a, a great opportunity to look across agriculture, forestry and other sectors at the needs for controlling in different invasive species and, and setting research priorities accordingly. Prospective long-term savings resulting from this research, very hard to predict, but they could well be in the tens of millions of dollars or, or even more. Third, the center would serve as a clearinghouse for research-based information and educational programs on terrestrial invasive species and the risks their establishment and management pose not only to forests, but to farmlands, wetlands, prairies, and other ecosystems. No such information clearinghouse currently exists. Once again, CFANS and the proposed center would be uniquely suited to fill this role. And finally, significant share of the center's funding would be directed toward graduate student and postdoctoral assistantships. As invasive species experts in state and federal agencies in the private sector retire, folks like me and my generation, this center would provide well-trained people to replace them. There are currently not enough well-trained people to address either industry's needs or public agencies' needs in this area. I've been privileged to work in Minnesota state government for over 32 years, and some of the, the finest colleagues I have are in this area of, of forest health and in, in, ag, in the Department of Agriculture as well. These folks are going to retire in droves over the next five plus years and we need well-educated folks coming behind them to replace them to address this enormous challenge that our state faces. That concludes my testimony and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Any questions for members? I don't see any. Is there anybody in the public who would like to uh, weigh in with a word or two? I don't see any questions from the public. Uh, Representative Falk. Fabian. I'm sorry. Fabian. Representative Fabian. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll reserve my comments and let uh, Representative McNamara, we've been talking, address it, okay? Madam Chair, I think we had uh, both had the same question. It's for Representative Falk. Uh, how much of the um, uh, committee's $15 million are you hoping to get in this bill? Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative McNamara. I'm hoping to get a sizable amount of money, and part of that negotiation is going to continue to be ongoing with Chair Virginia. So if you want to be helpful in helping me arm wrestle some more money for this, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Falk, is it your intention to just fund it over the next year, the rest of this biennium, or are you trying to lock up some money? There's talk in the, about a 10-year plan and so many million dollars in the university's presentation. How much are you hoping to get? Well, 
Madam Chair, Representative McNamara, as this is um, drafted here, or excuse me, drafted, can't speak. <coughs> if you look at the very last line, it says the appropriation available is available until June 30th, 2025. So we're trying to give ample time, but I know that there's a lot of need out there and we have pretty limited resources, and so we're trying to get as much money for this to get it up and running. Although I think part of the what we're establishing here is a framework, and as we have this prioritized list, then as those who serve on like LCCMR, they'll be able to go and look at that list and understand which are the threats that are probably the have the, the greatest potential for economic impact to our state and we need to look at uh, as quickly as possible. And so having that list is gonna help us going down the road be able to determine what needs to get prioritized as far as funding goes, whether it's through general fund appropriation, whether it's through LCCMR, or it could be some other form of appropriation. So Madam Chair, if I could just ask, so are you hoping to get at least five million? I, uh, Madam Chair, Representative McNamara, I think that would be a very nice number. Um, I think you know perhaps some of these questions might be better directed to the, the chair and, and what her purview is, but I'm going to argue for as much funding for this center as possible. Well, Madam Chair and Representative Falk, as a co-author of your bill, that's what I wanted to hear, that you're working hard because Representative Wagenius has got to uh, value all the different people that are trying to grab some of that $15 million, and I just want you to advocate real hard for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I would like to say, in just closing comments, too, I do appreciate the work of Dr. Burr and, and Representative Wagenius has been good to go and facilitate some of these conversations. And uh, I, I do think that this is a unique opportunity to go and span across a whole, um, whole number of areas that oftentimes you don't think of coming together, but this is a, a great opportunity to bring those groups together. And uh, I, I do appreciate the work that's gone into this. So thank you, members. Representative Fig. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to give it a try here. <clears throat> Representative Falk um, was... <laughs> was this a part of the governor's recommendations as well? Have you had co um, conversations with the governor's staff? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Fabian, you know, there's, uh, I can't remember the exact passage in Mason's, but um, I'm a kind of a believer in the fact that you don't reference the executive body when you're talking about the legislative process. But um, I do not believe this is part of the governor's recommendations, but that's the whole purpose of why we have a legislative body is to go and debate and bring forward additional ideas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in the Senate, um, is this moving there as well? Or there again, we're kind of maybe off, we'll have some offline conversations. <laughs> I do have a, um, one question for I Interim Director Burr, please. Senator Saxhawk <laughs> is the senator uh, who's carrying the bill. Interim Director Burr, thank you for being here. Uh, you said that extension was not a part of this uh, proposal, this bill. Right. Can you, would you care to elaborate on that for me, please, why it's not? Um, Madam Chair, Representative, this, this was intended to be a research bill primarily at this point to try and focus on getting a handle on how we might address the invasive species issue. Um, as that moves along, we would consider putting in proposals for extension uh, through LCCMR or the research proposals that are out there to extend this, this, this uh, activity. Madam Chair, if I could comment to that too, exactly what Dr. Burr stated, this is a research bill. We already have a number of delivery mechanisms, but until we can actually deliver a product, we actually have to go and figure out what works first. And so I, I think that's one of the reasons why we focus solely on the research aspect of it. Representative Baby and I would uh, suggest too that you look at uh, lines 2.15 to 2.20 in the bill. Uh, we are asking for uh, additional um, input as we get started uh, with this bill. So, members, I do not see any other questions. Representative Falk renews his motion that House File 2101, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Oh, I, if I said that wrong, it's 1976. Uh, Thank you for the, to the testifiers. Thank you, Representative Paul. Uh, next on the uh, agenda is Representative Lesh, and I move that House File 84 be laid over for possible inclusion in the um, uh, Environment Finance Omnibus Bill. And we welcome Representative Lesh. And in this case, the bill has been through a policy committee, 
and we are going to be talking about the finances of the bill. Representative Lesh, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, members, House File 84 uh, represents a long, slow slog uh, of about seven or eight years of working on this issue. In fact, I don't think there's another bill in my 12 years of the legislature that I've I've worked on longer with more input from more parties. I see people sitting around the table here who have worked on other versions or have had a lot of input into this one. Um, a lot of people around this body have worked on this bill or versions of it. Uh, this one now uh, represents a product of stakeholders input uh, on both sides uh, and is I think a version that folks uh, are going to be uh, happy with in general. Uh, it doesn't achieve completely what, what either side wants independently, but it strikes a good balance, which is supposed to be the product of what we do up here at the legislature. Members, um, Minnesota is among the top producers of puppies in the United States with some of the largest kennels producing hundreds and even over a thousand uh, litters. Kittens are also mass produced in Minnesota. Uh, the state of the existence of these animals in these cages uh, has been reflected in news reports, uh, both in the newspaper and on the news, that most of us don't want to watch. And that is what this bill is intended to address because until it's addressed, we're going to continually have to be subjected to these kinds of tragedies that happen in the dark corners of our state uh, which at this point uh, can only be exposed on a report-based system, which is clearly inadequate. The USDA also uh, licenses uh, approximately 33 uh, uh, producers in Minnesota that sell to pet shops, uh, but for all those uh, producers of litters who sell to you in the parking lot of the Home Depot, uh, or on Craigslist or across the internet, they all are completely uninspected um, and that's where generally we get the news reports of these tragedies occurring. Uh, so uh, this is intended, this bill is, is intended to create a uh, regulatory framework um, that, uh, that can help, help to address this. There are some uh, local units of government that also have their own laws, but there is no individual statewide uh, inspection system. So this bill intends to create that. Um, that's where the fiscal note comes from. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, Madam Chair, if uh, it was your intention to have testifiers on this or if it was just our, um, because we were, we were looking at laying it over in the finance portion of the bill. Um, if we were just going to go to questions for those individuals. I think we want to uh, hear if there are questions about the financing and uh, that would be where I would welcome questions. There may not be any either, so that's because a lot of people have already heard this bill once. Are there questions, Representative yeah. Hamilton? Um, Madam Chair, I do have a question uh, about the financing, and also we do have an A14 amendment as well. Okay. So, um, first of all, on the financing, I know I, I spoke to the, the Board of Animal Health, and they said that it's absolutely uh, uh, critical that the financing um, is uh, sufficient in order to administer this, Madam Chair. And so I guess I just want to make sure that we're on record that we do have the adequate funding that goes along with this bill to make sure that the Board of Animal Health is... Uh, um, well um, prepared, if you will, to administer this. Uh, Representative Black. Uh Thank you. Um, that, is, that is my understanding expectation as well, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so because this bill and, it's, and, and, and the product of it, and as Representative Hamilton correctly pointed out, we even have a, an amendment here today, the A14 amendment, which is intended to address uh, any lingering concerns because we've remained willing to work with folks and partners uh, all the way up to today and and hereafter to address any concerns. Um, but the A14 encompasses uh, those concerns and it's our expectation obviously that the financing be there to, to uh, properly uh, uh, make sure that the law is followed. Um, so I'd ask a uh, member since Ripson Hamilton brought it up and also we have a oral amendment. I have an oral amendment if the chair would consider it. 
This is the same language that was passed in the Senate the other day. Uh, so it's intended to be reflected in the Senate. And it includes on line uh, 6.33 under investigations. Um, humane agent appointed under section 34301 is made aware of a, and it would be included, an alleged violation under this chapter or chapter. And that same uh, word alleged would be added before the word violation on line 7.1. Uh, members, uh, this, uh, we do have a 24 hour rule. This seems very technical to me. And I would raise the rule if members would agree to that. And I would move the amendment. It, it makes sense to me. It's clarifying language is what it is. I don't see any objections. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any, any nays? Uh, that amendment is adopted. And then the only other item, uh, Madam Chair, is the, the A14 amendment as mentioned by Representative Hamilton. And whose amendment is this? Uh, Your Honor, this would be a, an author's amendment, but it's the product of uh, compromise between the stakeholders. Okay, uh, so I will move the A14 amendment. Uh, and would you like to explain it to folks? Uh, well, Madam Chair, um, if I could, because it was gone through be the, be, between the stakeholders, if I could have, you wanna, Mr. Clark, you want to come down? Um, it incorporates several different items, and just to make sure that I have it all correct, I'd rather have Mr. Clark explain it, if that's okay, Madam Chair. That would be fine. Mr. Clark, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, essentially, line 1.2 uh, through 1.4 identifies which sections of 343 and 346 would be applicable. Um, the other uh, 1.8 1, 1 through 1.10, 1 um, it, it just adds language that is uh, uh, found later in the bill, just makes the bill consistent. And um, uh, line 1.5 makes makes it clear that um, petty misdemeanors are not included when somebody would be, uh, when their license would be considered. And Madam Chair, this is, this is essentially a compromise as, as Representative Lesh mentioned between the stakeholders. I know Representative Hamilton and Representative Anderson we're part of these discussions, and um, hopefully that that's clarifies the, the amendment. Just as an overall, Madam Chair, um, some of the uh, uh, representatives of, um, of breeders uh, were concerned that some of the nuances could, could hook them in ways that they hadn't anticipated. Uh, and so this was clarifying language to establish that that was not our intent. I think that's clear, and I don't see any questions. All those in favor of the A14 amendment say aye. 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 Any objection? Okay, that amendment is adopted. I am not seeing any questions from members. Are there any uh, in members of the public who would like to testify strictly about the finances of this bill? This is a finance committee. I don't see any other members of the public. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative Lesh. And, mm -hmm. and Madam Chair, it's my understanding that this is being held over for possible inclusion in a, in a larger bill. That's uh, true. Correct? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Lesh, uh, we, uh, we have an agreement, um, you know, um, when we were in the last committee that uh, if uh, there was any provisions that were um, removed from this bill that are extremely important to the pet breeders, uh, whether it's the data privacy and some of the others, if any of those were removed or if this bill would morph into anything other uh, than what the um, intent is of, of the author and all the stakeholders uh, in addition to or um, going beyond the scope of what it says right here uh, with um, pet breeders, dogs, and cats that uh, Representative Lesh said that this would uh, then again no longer have his support and, and be pulled. And Madam Chair, I'm just, uh, there's been a lot of work uh, that's gone into this, and so I guess I'm now looking at you as the author that if you would uh, provide us with that same commitment as well. 
if this bill is included uh, in the omnibus bill, it will be included as is with the fiscal note that we have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Three people signed up to testify. Uh, if if they would like to speak about the finances, they're welcome to do so. Uh, we're going to take not a lot of time uh, on that, but you may may uh, may testify for a moment or two. Elaine Hansen would be first. Valerie LeBlue, and then Chain uh, Quinn Cheney. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Elaine Hansen. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Council of Dog Clubs and the Minnesota Outdoor Heritage Alliance. As most of you from other committees know, we are not supporting this bill. We do have some concerns that are very specific to the finances, however. This bill appropriates $310,000 in the coming year and then escalates up to something like $417,000. The three-year total is over a million dollars and that is to monitor the activities of an unknown number of pet breeders. The fiscal note estimates that there are 475 such breeders. Data from other states would indicate that this is most likely a gross inflation of the number of people to be regulated. Texas estimated 1,000 and has 36 licensed. Wisconsin estimated hundreds and a few dozens were licensed. Tennessee estimated 500 and in three years time 20 were found and licensed. But it's not just that number that makes Tennessee of interest, it's the fact that they incorporated a sunset clause into their bill. It expires in June 2014 and the bill to extend the deadline has failed in both chambers. The state of Tennessee is no longer spending in excess of a million dollars every couple of years to monitor a handful of cat and dog breeders. If this bill passes, I would ask that it be with an amendment to include a sunset clause to see whether in two or three years time this bill will in fact reduce animal cruelty, will find the miscreants among pet breeders and deal with them appropriately, will reduce consumer complaints about getting sick puppies over the internet or any other way, and also that it will fulfill its promise to make pet breeders somehow more responsible, more ethical, more competent. I'm not sure what it would be that needs to be improved because of the pet breeders that I know. All of them already are those things. Thank you. Uh, Valerie LeBou. My name is Valerie LeBeau and I am a pet breeder in the state of Minnesota. I operate Tales of Gold where I breed well-bred golden retrievers that are absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. Um, I am here to talk about the financial aspects of this bill as well and I have asked the page to pass out um, an economic impact study that shows how bills like this have affected actually the state of Missouri in this case. Um, First, my first point is that there is a negative return on investment for the state of Minnesota with this bill, both in the area of jobs and revenue. Um, jobs are going to be lost in your district, in every one of your districts if this bill passes. Breeders like myself, I'm a serious hobby breeder, um, rarely operate at a profit. When more government regulation and licensing fees are, are added onto us, many of us are going to go out of business or have to reduce our sizes significantly. But it's not only the breeders that are going to lose their jobs. Um, the ep economic impact study that I've passed around and also some of the other studies they've done in Missouri in particular um, shows that not only breeders are losing their jobs, but also because of the scarcity of well-bred pets and the scarcity of breeders. Um, what happens is it affects the pet food industry, it, it, it affects feed stores, veterinarians, groomers, boarders, me, and as, more. As we're talking about the, uh, the fiscal impact, we're talking about this and not the broad implications of that, that was done in policy committee. So we are talking about our consolidated fiscal note. Uh, as we talk about our finances. Right, well what I'm saying is that it will have a negative return 
for Minnesotans in the area of jobs and revenue. And that is definitely a financial aspect. The other th reason that this, and the second, my second point is that it's, there is, it's a, a poor use of funds because it only, um, it only, um, um, imposes these regulations on a small segment of the pet industry and not a larger segment of the pet industry. And um, this is really a David and Goliath story. Um, uh, we, have, we are talking about the fiscal note right now. Um, this is a finance committee and the testimony you're giving is the appropriate it was had in the policy committee. So if you could wrap it up. I don't think that uh, this argument was made in the policy committee because it's not the argument. We're talking about the fiscal note here. Was it, did, the, did they capture the right numbers in the fiscal note? Well, and I think that, that Elaine spoke to that in that there's going to be, you're going to find that, that there are probably much, many fewer breeders that are involved, okay? But the amount of funding that is being appropriated if you, if you, go, if you go ahead and pass this, okay, is enough to fund the entire pet industry, including the rescues and shelters that have much more, many more resources and assets and are, are the ones that are supporting this bill and to, to attack breeders to put them out of business and out of competition. Um, uh, they have, um, I mean, the Animal, Animal Humane Society, who has testified on this in many committee, in many committee hearings, okay, they have got, um, they've got over $20 million in, in assets and over $12 million in... Excuse me. We're, you're going to have to wrap this up. I am watching the clock, and I, I want to be respectful to anyone who wants to testify about the fiscal note that we have. Uh, to this bill. Uh, that is our job here and uh, if, if you would limit your comments to the fiscal note, I would appreciate it. Well, I think that it does have to do with the fiscal note when we're talking about that there is enough money here to cover the entire pet industry and it's not fair to just cover one small segment of it, especially since um, other, other parts of Minnesota statutes recognize that raising pets for, um, for or, ra or raising animals for pets is an important part of agriculture, okay? And the people who are, are the closest to agriculture are the pet breeders, okay? But this bill covers only them and it doesn't cover the other people that are selling pets. And the, the amount of appropriations that are in this bill would cover all of those. And so those people should be included. But my third and final point is that it's a bad investment for the state because it because spending a half a million dollars a year um, to do nothing more than current law to correct disease parasites and congenital de defects to stop animal abuse and cruelty and neglect which this bill does nothing to it, does, it adds nothing to current law to do those things um, um, these, those are all, those are all being prosecuted currently under, under, under current law and, um, and effectively under current law. This is a, this is absolutely not needed and it's a, a waste of taxpayer funds. Thank you. Uh, Lindy Forrester, uh, we will have just a, a moment or two of testimony. We have one more bill, uh, that I think members we can get through and not come this evening, but on the other hand, I know you would like my company this evening. Uh, welcome to the committee. If you could give your name for the record. Hi, I'm Lindy Forstatter. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm looking over this fiscal note. It doesn't quite go uh, where I had in mind. I just wanted to point out that um, some of the previous comments that pet breeders are not regulated around the state is not true. There are USDA regulations to inspect uh, pet breeders with four or more females who ship one or more puppies or kittens. Um, there's also 81 out of 87 counties have inspections. Um, so this bill is actually a duplicative pill, bill. It's not addressing a problem. There used to be a loophole that the USD is closed. And um, basically spending any extra money on this problem when a, a specific breeder could be inspected by their city 
and the USDA and the American Kennel Club and now the state. Um, it could be three, four, five inspections from different organizations and it is a waste of money. And I think that we need to look at uh, using money responsibly and this is quite an expensive um, task that's really not clear how much it's going to cost and how many people it's going to affect. I think it's based on a lot of guesswork and I think you should rethink it. There are a lot of um, other concerns that were not addressed in the previous committees such as co-owners um, going into who's affected by the bill and who's not uh, based on how many dogs they have that they co-own with other people. And um, so basically it's, it's just a bad bill overall and, and we really wish that it wasn't pushed so hard to only look at the financial aspect because it is something that impacts a lot of small mom and pop organizations and we feel like uh, the money behind it with animal welfare organizations is, um, is pushing something that's just giving all of us more bureaucracy and a harder time to do our hobby or our small business. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I don't see anybody uh, else, so uh, you, you may have one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Julie Gertis, and I am a professional pet breeder, but I'm more here today to speak as a concerned um, Minnesota citizen, and I will limit it to um, the fiscal note. Um, if you're going to pass this bill, I would like to see it be as self-funding as possible um, by raising the proposed licensing fee. Um, I would like to suggest to have just one flat fee over the 16 possible fee structures that are established. Um, I don't. From my experience, I've been a dog breeder uh, for 25 years. I do not agree with the estimate of 475 that's proposed. As we've watched in um, other states that have instituted licensing, their estimates are extremely elevated. My uh, um, expert uh, estimate would be that there would be between 100 and 200 breeders that would fall under this category. Currently, the licensing fee is established at um, starting at $100, max, maxing out at $250. I actually would like to see that be a flat licensing fee of $1,000 so that this is more of a self-funded uh, self policy so that it is not a burden on the Minnesota taxpayers. There's another change that I would like to recommend and that is that the breeder of excellence portion be stricken from this bill. Um, there was no specific uh, cost analysis given to attach to that portion of this bill, um, number one, so I can't really evaluate whether that would be something that any, any of you would think was a, a good uh, ex, uh, use of, of funds. However, I don't believe government should be um, instituting any kind of breeder of excellence program for any uh, business. <laughs> Um, the American Kennel Club has a Breeder of Merit program. The American Canine Association has a five-star blue ribbon program. The Cat Fanciers, Fanciers Association has a category of excellence. So the dog and cat breeding industry really does not need this for them. So I'd like to see that removed. And that was, that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, here, uh, I don't see anyone else. Uh, I, and I don't see any questions, so I renew my motion that House File 84, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Representative Blesch. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I would move House File uh, 2101 uh, for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And I have a uh, uh, A3 amendment to uh, get the bill in the shape that I would like it. And I would move the A3 amendment. Uh, this uh, amendment, you uh, mean in this morning? Oh, OK. All right. Uh, it didn't quite meet the 24-hour rule, but it's only like minutes away from it. So uh, I'm going to wait the rule. I have not heard any comments about it. And uh, the uh, Representative Hansen uh, moves uh, H21A3 amendment. A3 amendment. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any objection? Amendment is adapted.
to the uh, bill as amended, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I think uh, members of the committee are aware of the issue relating to uh, small plastic microbeads in some cosmetics. Uh, the bill, as it was introduced, was uh, requesting the uh, Pollution Control Agency to uh, look at sampling when they are out uh, doing the water, water testing. I have uh, Mr. Scuda here from the uh, Pollution Control Agency to give a little background on the issue. Uh, and uh, Representative McNamara, instead of millions of dollars, this particular appropriation is $1,000. So <coughs> we've been cutting back our requests. Good evening, Alex. Here we can become. Um, Mr. Scuda, one, welcome. Thank you. I'm Glenn Scooter, the Surface Water Monitoring Manager for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and Representative Hansen indicated just to give a little bit of background. Um, plastic microbeads are very tiny plastic particles introduced into personal care products, a variety of products from toothpaste to cosmetics, soaps, cleansers, that type of thing for their uh, abrasive properties. And given the products they're in, either during or after use, they get washed down the drain go to wastewater treatment plants. Uh, because they're so small and because they float, they don't settle out in wastewater treatment plants, they don't filter out, so they're passing through them uh, into the surface waters, the rivers of the state. Um, so the concern there is once they enter the environment as a plastic, they don't really break down. Um, they can be ingested by very small organisms in the food chain. Um, can disrupt then the food chain by either starving those organisms by um, making them feel essentially full so they don't continue to eat or clogging their digestive systems and then um, can uh, cause a problem at the lower levels of the food chain uh, so that there's not food for the higher organisms. Also um, p potential for the plastics to absorb toxins that are in the water, things like PCBs that again when they're ingested um, by the organisms can introduce those toxins into the, the food chain as well. So the, the bill, rather than requesting us to do some monitoring, which would be somewhat complicated because it's a different type of monitoring given the nature of the um, these floating plastic beads versus the typical kind of chemistry type monitoring we do, um, we're relying instead to uh, follow up on uh, work that's being done particularly in the state of New York where they're really <clears throat> furthest along on this type of research. There's um, researchers at New York universities that have been studying the Great Lakes and also inland waters of New York. We feel that rather than duplicating their efforts, um, we can do a very inexpensive literature search of their work and whatever other information is available out there, compile that uh, for uh, your consideration in developing um, policy related to this. Questions, members? Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. <laughs> to the testifier, you mentioned that uh, these light beads wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't settle out. I can understand that, but uh, you said they also wouldn't filter out because they were light. Uh, I don't quite understand why a filter wouldn't get them just because they were light. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, more so the filtering just because they're so small. Um, the particles are literally, if you can picture the size of Abraham Lincoln's eye on a penny, some of them are about that small. Um, so they're, they're just, they have been found in New York to be passing through the plants in wastewater effluent. So it's more about size. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for Representative Hansen, I'm curious about the $1,000 fiscal impact of this. Uh, I know we can probably hire <laughs> legislators at $66 a day, but uh, I'm curious what the $1,000 is going to do. <clears throat> well, Madam Chair, Representative Torkelson, this was the fiscal note that came from the agency uh, on, on that, so uh, I think that could be <clears throat> better directed to the agency on what the $1,000 pays. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll redirect my question to the agency. Madam Chair, Representative Torkelson, um, that's a, just a cost estimate of the amount of staff time that it would take to compile the information. Um, so we just looked at past studies that we've done for, for this body, um, and we feel that that's a, a good ballpark, um, that we can constrain it to, to that small amount and pull together the information. I 
I don't see any other um, questions. I don't see anybody from the audience getting up <coughs> and raising their hand. Uh, so, Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2101, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Representative Thank you. Hansen. Mr. Scuda, members, I'm going to miss you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> huh? We can do, we're going to do minutes. Who is, who is going to do minutes for us? I'll move the minutes of the March 11th and March 13th meetings. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Representative Freeberg moves the minutes of March 11th and 13th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any objection? Minutes are adopted. Thank you, members. We will not see you tonight, uh, and, but we will see you on Thursday for a possibly very long day. Uh, meetings adjourned.